I don't know if you've experienced this, Cristiano, where you're on a group text with a bunch of people, and I understand that you have an Android, and people get upset <laughs> that now the text thread has reverted from blue to green. So I experienced this from the Android side. We have this like big family group chat, and whenever we're planning a vacation or something, there's a couple iPhone users, and on my end, I'm always seeing like, oh, X like liked this post, or X laughed at this post, and instead of just getting like a thumbs up that I'm sure like Apple people see, um, and on the other end, they're just seeing my little green bubbles popping up all over the place. Yeah, and they're like, what is this? Right. <laughs> well, I've definitely forced some group chats to migrate to other messaging platforms precisely because I can't deal with this anymore. <laughs> Christiana Lima Strong covers tech policy for The Post. And I wanted to ask him about this weird quirk of how we text, not because I find it annoying, though I do, but because I spotted a description of this exact situation in a lawsuit brought by the U.S. government late last week. This little thing that we're talking about that might seem like a minor annoyance is, is at the heart of this massive antitrust lawsuit against Apple that the federal government is now um, taking up. And basically the argument that they've made is that Apple, instead of trying to compete on the merits with other companies and developers, it has made it harder for developers to come up with products like a cross-messaging platform that would work seamlessly between Android and iPhone users. And in doing so, it has locked people into the Apple ecosystem. And so uh, federal enforcers are now making this um, as a part of a broader case to say that Apple has a monopoly over smartphones and that the government should step in. From the newsroom of The Washington Post, this is Post Reports. I'm Elahe Izadi. It's Tuesday, March 26. Today, Cristiano and I talk about this major antitrust case against Apple, how it could change our phones in the future, and how this is actually part of a bigger trend of the government going up against big tech. Uh, good morning. Earlier today, the Department of Justice, joined by 15 states and the District of Columbia, sued Cristiano, Apple first, can you walk me through this lawsuit against Apple? I understand it was filed by the Justice Department and also a number of state and district attorneys. Can you lay out what is at the heart of the allegation here and what are they accusing Apple of doing? Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, the, the federal government, the Justice Department, and 16 state and district attorneys general are accusing Apple of holding and maintaining um, an illegal monopoly when it comes to the smartphone market. So this is really taking squarely aim at Apple's signature flagship product in the iPhone. And what the Justice Department is arguing is that through various policies over different types of services, Apple has curated this very tightly knit walled garden to try to keep people um, on Apple services. Apple has maintained monopoly power in the smartphone market, not simply by staying ahead of the competition on the merits, but by violating federal antitrust law. In doing so, it has boxed out competitors who might develop products that could interface with Apple and, you know, potentially threaten users' reliance on Apple products. And in doing so, it's also, you know, locked in users into potentially, um, you know, spending more money to have this immersive Apple experience that the company has said it's very proud of. Consumers should not have to pay higher prices because companies break the law. We allege that Apple has employed a strategy that relies on exclusionary, anti-competitive conduct that hurts both consumers and developers. So what is the, the law here that they're accused of breaking? And also, it's focused on iPhones. How important are iPhones to Apple's bottom line? Yeah, so that's the three trillion dollar question right there because you know the, oh, the wow, just, a lot of money, <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, that's roughly what Apple's valuation is these days. They think they hmm. dip a little beneath that, but 
the the Justice Department argues that Apple has um, 70% control over sort of the high-end smartphone market. So first of all, the iPhone is um, incredibly lucrative for Apple. It is at uh, the very core of its business. Um, and so this really strikes at that. Um, they are accusing the company of breaking um, the Sherman Act, which is sort of the, the foundational antitrust law in the United States. And basically, they're arguing that the company has engaged in exclusionary conduct, that it hasn't mm-hmm. dealt in, in in good faith with developers, and it's taken steps through these restrictive, it's called, the, the suit calls it whack-a-mole policies, um, where every time a developer is looking to come up with something that could increasingly migrate people away from Apple services, Apple will come in and put in sort of restrictive guardrails to, to keep hmm. people in. So that that's pretty much at the heart of it. And we see this coming up across different spaces, whether it's you know cross-platform messaging or whether it's um, digital wallets. Yeah. Can you tell me some more examples that the government cited in its lawsuit in arguing that Apple is essentially wielding a monopoly beyond the text bubbles that we've discussed? Yeah, absolutely. So one another thing that the government points to is this idea of the development of super apps. Now, this is basically something that would kind of be a one-stop shop app that's like it's your social media platform. Maybe it's also your digital wallet. Um, so it, it serves lots of different functions. And it's said that Apple has basically made it really difficult for developers to come up with these because of this kind of walled garden approach that Apple has. Um, Oh, so so, instead of like having a bunch of individual apps doing individual things, a super app would have a lot of different functions within one app. Right, exactly. And we, we don't, there's not really a a supremely popular one of those in the U.S. It has taken off in other places like India Hmm. and China where there's WeChat, which is incredibly popular. Um, This is something like Elon Musk has talked about creating with X, right? He talks Hmm. about this idea of like the everything app. But what the government is arguing is that by making it harder for these to develop, it's a way of Apple entrenching its position. Because if you have an app that gives you everything, maybe you don't need the expensive iPhone hardware um, that powers these various Apple services. Now, we should say that this is something that Apple has really pushed back on. Apple has said that, you know, it it isn't locking users in. People come to Apple because they like how interconnected everything is, because it's popular, and that the steps that it's taken are to keep up in incredibly competitive markets that it's trying to be successful in. Yeah, and how has Apple responded to some of the other allegations made in this lawsuit? Yeah, I mean, so first off, Apple has said that it um, thinks this lawsuit is wrong on the facts in terms of some of the allegations that the Justice Department is making. It's also wrong on the law. And it has said that it's vigorously going to fight this lawsuit. So this is going to be, and I mean, you know, you'd expect that this is um, going right at their flagship product. And so Apple, you know, is going to put up a fight against something alleging that it's a monopoly, of course. But, you know, it's pushed back on on this idea that it's just boxing people in for its own power. It said that some of these steps are taken for user security or to make usability in the interface more friendly. So this hmm. is really going to be what's going to now play out in the courts, um, is whether the federal government can make the case that Apple's wrong in that assertion. And I mean, that just that idea that Apple's privacy and security is better than than other tech companies. Is that even true? What do we know about that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's difficult to assess. But one example the the Justice Department has um, argued, you know, we were talking about cross-platform messaging is that with this idea of, you know, someone from iPhone messaging Android users that, you know, some of those exchanges are unencrypted. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about this, but like the, the quality of someone sends messages, the quality is diminished. And so a, a part of this is um, the federal government arguing that Apple has made this choice to degrade this service to make it less appealing to want to, to switch to another service and also made it um, appear unsafe potentially. And so uh, this is this is going to be sort of a very like fact specific thing that mm-hmm. um, the the courts are going to have to try to settle moving forward. 
I'm also wondering, Cristiano, if there is any merit to the argument that Apple is making and this idea that, you know, not it's not creating a monopoly. It's just, you know, they've made a product that consumers want more, that it's just a better product or that, um, you know, it's, it's in a competitive market. They've just tried to set themselves apart and it's been successful as a business. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what you make of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have heard for years from from smaller developers that Apple, by imposing this walled garden, has kept them out, has made it harder for them to succeed, to compete, to, to build up in size. And so while this antitrust lawsuit is sort of the biggest case that the federal government has taken up on this, we have seen this argument play out mm. in previous lawsuits against the company. Um, we're now, we've seen it being taken up in Europe. And there have been instances where Apple has come out victorious. So there was a lawsuit um, filed by Epic Games, which makes the you know incredibly popular Fortnite game series um, that alleged that Apple had a monopoly under federal law. That case dealt with the company having restrictions in its app store policies around developers being able to have basically rival payment processing systems and things that work outside of the app store. And so Apple has always very tightly regulated this and, and restricted the ability of developers to create things that don't use the Apple app store. And, you know, this kind of like funnels a lot of business through Apple, which imposes a hefty commission um, on those services. But Apple largely prevailed in that lawsuit and the courts found that the developer did not make that case. And so we'll, we'll have to see if, if this will be an instance where the federal government is able to make its case. After the break, we talk about the odds of this new lawsuit against Apple actually going to trial and how it's just one of several legal fights the government is waging against big tech. We'll be right back. So, Christiana, what's next for this new lawsuit against Apple? Will this actually go to trial? Do you expect that? Yeah, so Apple, um, as we've talked about, is definitely going to put up a fight here and has indicated as much. Uh, sort of the next main step is, as you alluded to, like, will this go to trial? The tech companies have been very aggressive over the years in trying to get these lawsuits dismissed. But increasingly, in recent years, we've seen that a lot of these cases have gone to trial. You know, there are two antitrust lawsuits against um, Google that are going to trial, and, and there are other cases that are um, sort of making their way through the system that are poised to go to trial. And so kind of the, the next battlefront you might see there would be, you know, this is a really sprawling lawsuit. Um, and, it you know, it's likely that Apple is going to try to get at least some of the claims here, whether it be about, you know, the cross platform messaging, whether it's about the super apps, whether it's about digital wallets, to get part of these claims dismissed and try to winnow down the scope of this lawsuit. Google was able to do this um, to an extent in one federal lawsuit targeting its digital advertising business, where it got some of those claims dismissed. And then we'll see if we get to trial, uh, which would likely, you know, take a very long time to play out. Um, so I think both sides are really, you know, digging in for, for a long battle here. I mean, this could be months, years. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the one of the Google antitrust lawsuits was filed in late 2020, and we're just about to get a decision now. Um, and wow. so it could be years before we see this ultimately play out if Apple is unsuccessful in just getting this um, dismissed right away. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned these other legal actions that the United States government has taken against big tech companies. There's what it's done with Google. There's what's happening with Apple. There's also, you know, a lawsuit right now um, against Amazon. And we have to mention here that Amazon founder Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post. And that's also an antitrust lawsuit. So 
Do you view this Apple lawsuit as part of a bigger trend right now that the government's posture is taking? Is this unique as opposed to what has, you know, the, the federal government has done before? This is absolutely part of a bigger trend. We, you know, for a long time, we heard from antitrust advocates that the federal government was kind of just sitting around on a lot of these allegations that have existed for a long time, that these companies were boxing out smaller companies to um, enrich themselves. But we're, more and more, we're seeing federal regulators file lawsuits alleging, and, you know, of course, the, the facts vary, but a lot of it is that these companies control so much of the markets that they operate in that they're able to set the terms and create an uneven playing field where they rise and their competitors fall. And so the Justice Department is a is a huge part of this. The Federal Trade Commission is leading some of these lawsuits as well against Meta. And it's definitely part of a bigger push, you know, not just by the Biden administration, but a bipartisan cast of uh, state hmm. officials. The Trump administration also kicked some of this off. Um, and, and part of a broader reckoning in the U.S. about the power of these American tech behemoths that, you know, have both come to, to define innovation and, and success in the U.S., but people also feel have defined runaway power and um, the way that these massive corporations are able to tilt the scales in their favor, as, as these regulators allege. Cristiano, I'm wondering, just stepping back and thinking of all of this, is, is there an undercurrent of a massive cultural shift, at least in this country, of taking these companies to task that, I mean, they're huge, powerful companies now, but I, it feels like, you know, the, ins, the idea of a lot of these companies from the beginning is, oh, we're mavericks, we're, you know, we have to experiment, and now they are just such a part of our, you know, the institutional landscape of who controls what. And are you sensing almost like a shift culturally, politically, the winds have changed? So certainly in Washington, that's taking place where, you know, you go back eight years before the 2016 election, there was not a lot of discussion on Capitol Hill at, at federal agencies about, you know, potential antitrust abuses by these companies. And certainly there's been a reckoning since then, and we see that in both parties. But something we've heard the, the tech industry argue in response is that you don't necessarily see that to the same extent among the broader public because a lot of these companies remain very popular with users and with consumers who who like the gadgets and the services and the platforms that they're providing. And so in a way, this is also a, a battle over public opinion. Um, of course, this will play out in the courts, but uh, the companies will argue that, you know, folks are freely choosing their products because they have been competing. And we're going to see whether the courts agree with the federal government's argument that they haven't, that they're they're rigging the game to benefit themselves. Well, Cristiano, thank you so much for joining me and explaining all this to me. And I will text you green or blue bubbles be damned. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's do it. <laughs> Cristiano Lima Strong covers tech policy for The Post. There are a couple of other big stories we're following today. Very early Tuesday morning, a major bridge in Baltimore collapsed into the water below. This happened after a cargo ship hit the bridge. The Baltimore Fire Department labeled the incident a mass casualty event. As of right now, the number of victims is unclear. Rescuers are searching for several people, and vehicles were detected in the water. The ship was traveling relatively fast and lost power right before the collision. But it's not clear yet why the crash caused this massive collapse. Our colleagues are following this all very closely, and we're going to link to their latest coverage in our show notes. Also on Tuesday, the Supreme Court heard arguments in an important abortion case, looking at access to the drug mifepristone, which was approved two decades ago and is used in over half of abortions in the United States. The justices seem skeptical of limiting access to the drug. The problem with all drugs is there are complications in virtually all of them. Yes, and virtually at all. what level the cost-benefit analysis tells you to stop prescribing something is a very difficult question, isn't it? 
And that's a question and that Congress has entrusted to FDA. That's it for Post Reports. Thanks for listening. This episode was produced by Renny Stranofsky with help from Peter Bresnan. It was mixed by Sean Carter and edited by Maggie Penman. If you're looking for the latest updates on the big news of the day, check out our morning news briefing, The 7. We bring you the seven stories you need to know about every weekday morning by 7 a.m. You can listen to it wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Elahe Izadi. We'll be back tomorrow with more stories from The Washington Post.